Uh, I want to talk, I'm kind of at a moment in my art thing when I'm between, or I'm moment of transition, sort of extended moment of transition. So I'm going to kind of be a little bit all over the place, uh, and I'll try and do that as smoothly and painlessly as possible for everyone. Um, but if you have a question, just raise your hand. Um, I can see everyone, I think. Um, OK, so I will begin. Uh, my education, my when I went to college, I studied Latin and Greek, um, classic literature. And I've always been interested in using the classical world as a framework for understanding now, um, my own experience and kind of the world around us. Um, and I've been always interested in this tension between the classical world as like a kind of conceptual and visual foundation for um, institutions of power, uh, law, finance, um, and the way that like the, the visual uh, world of the classical world, um, this is the New York Stock Exchange, um, has given us a basis for, uh, you know, the capitalist world that we live in. Um, but our understanding of the classical world, or like what we imagine that it was, was, uh, is kind of inaccurate and, um, informed by our own desire for it to be something that it wasn't. Um, this is the Acropolis. This is what the Acropolis probably looked like. This is Caesar Augustus. This is probably what it looked like. Um, and a lot of the ways that we, the, the visual language of power in this country um, and in Western government is informed by uh, the visual language of the ancients. Um, the bust is descended from the herm, which is a, a bust on a pillar that has a phallus on it. Um, and I always think of that because power is such a, you know, men and their fallacies, right? Um, but to, to kind of have that, explore this kind of weird world back and forth between what we, the way we use the classical world and what it actually was and who we actually are or who, you know. Um, and the other thing that I'm really interested in about the ancient world is the idea of just like, there's all this like special stuff. This is an encaustic painting in, um, in the Getty Museum in LA. Made 2,000 years ago for someone's um, mummy burial in uh, Egypt. Um, and it's like stunningly present and gorgeous. And the idea that there are these artifacts that have so much personality and so much, um, I don't know, they exist in this like mythic space that I've always been fascinated by. Um, back when I was studying literature uh, and when I moved on to doing painting and drawing, I've just always been fascinated by these little kind of moments in the classical world of just like weird stuff, you know, that stands out in, con in contrast to like all the marble pillars and, you know, the, all that shit. Um, this is in the um, Art Institute in Chicago. 
Every time I go to Chicago, I go and look at this. And Roman frescoes in this kind of, like, this space that these, that these Roman paintings are in is unlike anything um, from the Renaissance onward. It, it, it's this weird world, like, timeless, mythological, and I've always kind of tried to make work that fits into that timeline. When I was, I studied painting uh, in grad school, and I was always trying to like get into this like kind of Greco-Roman thing world in a way that wasn't too um, derivative or appropriately derivative, I guess. But I couldn't, I couldn't like paint on anything smaller than a whole wall, um, and which was fine when you're in grad school because they give you all these big walls to paint on. <laughs> um, but then when you Move to New York, there's no extra space to paint on a big wall. <laughs> and so, like, I kind of freaked out when I got to, back to New York. Mm. And I didn't really, like, I couldn't, I had this little studio and I was, like, bugging out and I couldn't finish anything and I couldn't work on anything that was um, smaller than a whole mural and I was, like, really confused. So, I just started doing performance work. Um, with a collaborator of mine, uh, Tay Blow, who's here, a uh, very brilliant uh, sound designer, video designer, thinker. And we made all these, we started doing all these um, works that were sort of ceremonial takes on, um, trying to create a ceremonial space to process contemporary digital culture, uh, media culture. Some, this is a calf, a golden calf that had fake blood in the neck and you cut the head off the calf and poured it on one's face and that was the ritual in this case. Um, and we created these sort of spaces, performance spaces um, with drinking, different kinds of things and other stuff, hats, lots of hats. Um, I don't want to play a video. We wrote songs, we did other stuff. Um, uh, mm, mm, eh. um, so we did this for like 10 years, and then we did this show. We got, we got a creative capital to grant to do this show, which was like 50 grand. And we did this show, and it took us three years, and it was all based on this YouTube video, and we, um, a shopping video. A haul, do you guys know what haul videos are? Or is that like, do you kids know what haul videos are? Um, it's a video, for those who don't know, it's a video where you go and buy a bunch of stuff, and then you show what you got. You know, I went to Sephora and I got this thing, and then I went and, then, and we found this um, this haul video that had like 20 views, and we started watching it. And I think we watched it probably 500 times because we were fascinated by it. Because the woman, like, usually you you buy something special, you know, and it's like, oh, I got this. You have like an angle or like you had, you know, you're an influencer or something. And this woman like went to Kohl's and bought a bunch of stuff at Kohl's. Um, and so we, we, and but there was something about her performance that was so authentic. And she was such a, I don't know, there was something like sticky about her performance. And so we kept watching it, watching it, watching it. Um, and then, uh, we downloaded the video. We kept watching it, the downloaded version. Then we went back to find the woman's account to like write to her and just say, hey, like, we love your work. Um, and it was gone. And there was no way of finding it. Because um, the way the YouTube URLs are, they're all totally random. And so you can't like go, there, there's no directory tree on the URL. 
So we don't know who she is. Um, and we were stuck with this video that we didn't know who she was. I want to talk my way through this one because there's no other way to explain it. Um, so anyway, the video is gone. We bought all the stuff that she had bought, uh, with a few exceptions of stuff that was no longer available. Um, there was a Bobby Flay pizza cutter that she bought. Do you guys know who Bobby Flay is? She bought a Bobby Flay pizza cutter. I'm tempted to just play the whole... Anyway, we recreated the video with a different actress. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just do that. So these are all objects that we have, this is an actress, um, these are all objects that we have recreated or sourced. I painted that t-shirt. And that one too. Uh, but anywho, um, every single thing that I purchased was from Kohl's, except for this first item that I'm going to show you. Um, I went to Starbucks earlier today because I heard that the pumpkin spice latte was back and I had to go and have one. And so I went with my brother before him and his wife left for South Carolina. Uh, and I saw this cute little mug. Just has a hand on it. I'm pretty sure it was a uh, Valentine's Day mug um, because it has a little you, me at the rim. You can sort of see it. Um, but I justified this purchase because I broke one of our mugs the other day, and it was one of my all-time favorite mugs. It was a, a Wicked the Musical mug uh, that I bought the first time I ever saw the show, and now it's gone. The handle just popped right off, and it's it away. But yeah, I got this cute little mug from Starbucks. It was on sale for $3.49, plus tax. Can't beat that. Uh, so yeah, that was the first purchase of this Joy's Labor Day. I was going to stay inside all day and work on my um, senior thesis for my English seminar, um, which it is Harry Potter related, if you didn't know. Um, and so far, uh, the things that I researched, I'm really excited about. Um, so anywho, maybe there's a way I could share with y'all without copyright infringement going on. Don't want no one stealing my awesome work, so. Uh, uh, the second thing I bought, um, this wasn't, I'm sorry, this was at Kohl's. The first thing I picked up at Kohl's, the whole reason I went to Kohl's and then ended up leaving the so just to pause for a sec, I, I don't know if we want to watch the whole thing. It's um, it's a lot of stuff like that. It's like she gets a she a wicked the musical mug broke, and then she got this Starbucks mugs, um, the you me and at the rim, um, and she gets some jeans. Um, and we can't tell if her partner is named Brian or Brad because she has a southern accent. Um, Brian, Brown. Um, so it's like Brian or Brad, um, she, and the, the crowning piece was this Bobby Flay pizza cutter, which by the time we got around to trying to find it was no longer available. Um, no, we bought the last two. <laughs> we bought the last two. Um, and then we went back to buy more and they were gone, and there was no even a record of a Bobby Flay pizza cutter ever having existed because of the way the um, product st design works. Like, there's no archive of shitty products that you can look something up in, you know? It's, and, it's, and so we became really fascinated with this video, which was in an age when you have access to everything you want, both in terms of if you want to buy it and if you want to watch it, to have a disappearing YouTube video and a disappearing pizza cutter. Um, it, we became fascinated by this whole thing and what this video said about death, about um, uh, global capitalism, about uh, the way that products are designed and manufactured. So I met with like a Kohl's, I, I met a Kohl's product developer and talked about the Bobby Flay pizza cutter and the different iterations of the design over the years. And like, we had this whole, like, we spent three years on this. Um, 
we developed a uh, camera obscura. Does it, who knows what a camera obscura is? It's a room that they developed in the Renaissance where it's, it's the basis of a camera. Um, camera means room in Latin. Um, you have a lens here, you have a room, and if, you have, if it's dark inside the room and light outside, it'll project actually upside down inside the room. And it's, it's basically like what a camera does, but big enough to walk, in, walk into. Um, so we developed a, and I could be going into too much detail, but I feel like I have to. Um, we developed a big reverse camera obscura that was a small room that was really bright that could project analog without a projector onto a large surface. Um, does that make sense? Kind of? Um, so, so it was our way of investigating this video content, you know, because there's so many lenses. I have one in my pocket right now. I have two in my pocket. One pointed at me. Um, you know, there's lenses everywhere, there's cameras everywhere, there's screens everywhere, and we wanted to take that thing and make it as precious as the Hall video, as the Bobby Flay pizza cutter, as each one of us is, and maybe, uh, just in spite of the fact that we maybe forget how special everything is, and it, uh, every, all this shit that we're wearing was made by human hands, right? Um, and it's part one of the kind of f axioms of global capitalism is that you forget that someone sewed this button onto your shirt. Um, and so we went into, you know, it, we made, it was a beautiful show. I want to show what the camera obscura looked like, I guess, um, and then maybe move on. share with you all what I bought on this fabulous Labor Day. Um, it's my first being at a work environment that's actually off for Labor Day, so yay for being professional. Uh, but anywho, um, every single thing that I purchased was from Kohl's, except for this first item that I'm going to show you. Um, I went to Starbucks earlier today because I heard that the pumpkin spice latte was back. And I had to go and have one. Uh, so I went with my brother before him and his wife left for South Carolina. Um, and I saw this cute little mug. Just has hand on it. Um, I'm pretty sure it was a Valentine's Day mug um, because it has a little. Anyway, you get the idea, I think. Um, so reperforming the work in a ceremonial context. Um, we were thinking a lot about uh, Persephone and Hades and the, um, the rites of Elysium um, uh, and uh, anyway, I thought it was a beautiful show. Our, um, the publicist that we hired to promote the show uh, had a bout of depression or something and failed to publicize the show that we had worked for three hours, three years at great expense to produce. Um, so it's not that nobody came, um, our friends came, um, but one of the things, those of you that do theater, one of the things that is amazing and also awful about theater is that it if no one comes, it doesn't exist. Um, it, it, 
you can make a record of, you know, like I'm showing you this video, but the video sucks compared to the real, th you know, like the, you need, you know, like we were hoping that someone would come um, from another theater and say, let's do this again. And then another theater would say, let's do this again. And then we, and all of our pieces to that point had been reviewed negatively by the New York Times, but at least they had been reviewed. And at least there was a record of them having existed. And so we thought it was kind of fitting that this uh, show about this disappearing YouTube video featuring this disappearing Bobby Flay pizza cutter uh, disappeared. Um, and then I turned 40, like two months later, and I kind of freaked out. <laughs> and I was just like, I, I don't know if I could do this. Like, I don't know if I can do an art form that can disappear like this. Um, and so I was kind of like freaked out and I went to Rome and started looking at all this old stuff again and um, just kind of thinking about time and thinking about ephemerality and ephemerality in times of global capitalism and consumer culture. Um, and just like bugging out on this weird shit that they had and like, and thinking about the fact that like these guys, you know, a lot of expense went into each one of these objects and a lot of, a lot of people, in order to make something like this, you have to extract wealth from someone. Um, and, you know, so there's something kind of like Empire makes marbles. This is in the Louvre, um, but I put it in here anyway. But this little hand, like, isn't that cool? Um, like the baby's gone, but you have this moment of touch. But just heads and like all these fragments. Big baby. Um, this is a big like onyx baby. And you're just like, like, you're just like, holy shit, like, there's so, you know, and it's all from two, I don't know who made that, and I don't care who made it, um, it's, a, it's, but it's here for us, at least, and I was just like, I want to be part of this thing, I, in my old age, in my middle age, I want to become a sculptor. I mean, come on, it's so cool. This guy, like they used to, in the Middle Ages, I think his name is Triumpho or something, they used to write wishes and complaints and stick them like in his belly button or something. And they would, like you could write an anonymous complaint, like Marcus stole my rooster or something and then stick it in his belly button. Um, so yeah, like, what about this thing? And so that, that's kind of like, that was my freak out. And so I got back and I was like, I'm gonna get a bunch of clay um, and just start making stuff. And I didn't really know what, but I was in freak out mode, so I didn't really know what I was doing. Is this, is the sound, am I speaking too close? It's okay? Um, and I just kind of started making stuff, you know? Um, and, and you know the clay, it's like plasticine, like, um, you know, that it doesn't dry, like oil clay. I was just like, I don't know what this stuff is, but it, it, was, it was almost just like coming to me. Because um, I was in freak out mode. And kind of like a lot of, it's sort of like trying to think about a, a new mythology stuff that was in a mythological space, a figurative space. But it was just kind of like, I was just kind of going for it. And then, COVID-19 emptied the streets of New York. Um, and I couldn't, I, was, uh, I couldn't, 
I couldn't cast it. I was going to like cast them. And, but I didn't know how to do it and I didn't know any of that stuff and all that stuff. And so I was locked in my apartment. And so I freaked out again, you know, still in freak out mode. Um, so I just started drawing this cactus, like, you know, <laughs> like, ah! um, and then I was like, okay, I got to do something else. And so I got some, um, uh, I started painting in egg tempera and kind of like, sort of like trying to make painting, paintings that existed in this same uh, space. And this is kind of like, you know, yeah, this is, there's a lot of stuff about statuary and monuments, uh, tearing down monuments uh, of slave owners uh, and um, other fucked up humans that uh, was happening also during COVID. Um, so just kind of, I don't know, like, but just like being in my apartment, being like, Whoa. Um, and then I had this, this is actually before COVID, I had like a kind of drug trip uh, dream about a knife. Uh, and uh, I'm going to skip that. Um, <laughs> but uh, just thinking about knives, thinking about knives as a metaphor for a kind of consciousness that I've, I don't know, nah, food, knives. And these are all, I mean, I don't know if you saw the show, but they're all small. Little drawn, uh, I would start, I don't know. I put this into just like, this is how I was coming up with stuff, just like, Make a drawing and then make a painting. <laughs> I don't know. Knife, fish. And kind of like like what the gods of now would be like, you know, like um, if, if who are the gods of like, we live in this time of like kind of almost like, uh, yeah overabundance, um, like almost like catastrophic abundance. And I don't know, just like kind of thinking about who are the gods of overabundance, you know? But I didn't really think that hard. I was just like, ah, ah. Um, corn god. You know, like how much corn, if you guys like studied how much corn we directly and indirectly, like we, every, we're like made out of corn, you know, but we don't have a corn god. Capitalism has yet to invent a corn god. So I did. Like. Just thinking about college for some, just, College is a place where, like, there's these columns um, and these, like, these spaces of uh, power and prestige where people just go and get fucked up and, like, rage, you know, and just, I don't know. These are all the, it's hard to see, but the, um, the words on the ice cream cones are the, um, mottos for the Ivy League schools. And, you know, like, I don't know. One of the things that I like about the Roman stuff is uh, you don't, you know that it means something, but you don't really know what it means, but you kind of know what it means, but it doesn't really matter if you know what it means. So I was kind of trying to make stuff like that. Thinking about Uggs as a kind of, who here ha ever had Uggs? I mean, not me. But show of hands, show of hands. Um, 
I was talking to a friend who, you know, about how Uggs is a kind of like, we don't, capitalism has also, is it annoying that I say, I don't know what else to say when I say capitalism, I'm talking about like the, the system of interacting with each other that we have right now uh, in economic kind of psychological, spiritual life that, I don't know, that produces, uh, I don't know, that relies on the exchange of goods and money and finance and shit like that. Um, anyway, that we don't really have a coming of age ceremony, except for like maybe you get your first car. Um, but I think getting your first pair of Uggs is a kind of ceremony for a lot of people, especially, I feel like it's more towards women, but it's like, it's like, this is your first like big footwear purchase and it um, introduces you into a life of buying stuff. You know, it's like you're, they buy it for you, but it's like your first thing that you can kind of fetishize and get into. Um, so I was just kind of thinking, like just thinking about um, Uggs as a kind of like, this is, like about a first pair of Uggs, you know? Um, and also golden retrievers as a kind of god of, dog god of capitalism. Uh, optimism, you know, happy. Second pair of Uggs. More Uggs. Um, the drawing versus the... Multiple peepees. Um, and then I finally got to do some frescoes, some actual frescoes, which is a really cool other kind of old, all those Roman paintings that I showed you were frescoes, which is painting directly into wet plaster. Um, super indelible, super lustrous. Um, so I got to do some of those. Just thinking about these, I don't know, I don't know what this is. Um, okay, so then COVID ended, right? Um, <laughs> and uh, I was like, okay, what do I do with this stuff? So, and it, like, how do I make this into bronze? Um, so, step one is uh, call your friend who's a master mold maker. Um, and have him come over and teach you how to make molds. Make a bunch of molds. Colin said people might be interested in like the um, uh, technique of casting, maybe. Um, anyway, I'm going to tell you, and if you're not interested, just put your head down. Um, are, are people in? I'll just show you pictures and then raise your hand if you're interested. You make a mold. Hot wax goes into the mold. Beeswax. You get a bunch of pieces. Stick them together. Take them apart again. Um, you have to add this like sprues and stuff that, so that the, um, the gases. So this wax gets stuck kind of dunked in some ceramic mixture. And then you pour hot bronze into that. Um, so all of the little gating, and st this is called gating. It allows for the wax, for the bronze to move in and around the figure, the sculpture, and for the gas to come out. Da -da -da. And here is a video of that being poured at the foundry. Whoa. Uh, so then you get a bunch of bronze pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much does it cost? Uh, it is, it gets more and more expensive as, so I've cast everything in kind of over two years. Um, 
And it was a lot cheaper, and now it is, like, I can't, I kind of have to stop, <laughs> you know, it's super expensive. Or it has to get smaller or something. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, uh, because the, the material is expensive, the energy is becoming more expensive, the labor is becoming, you know, like, a, it's one of those, like, hyperinflationary uh, mediums. So then you cut all the little sprues off, you weld it together. And then you have to put a patina on it. And this is what they look like now. And I'm still kind of like working on this stuff, so I'd, I don't know, I figured I'd show you anyway, but like I say, a moment of transition. Uh, whoop. This, is, this is electroplated gold. Um, it's gold. I like the idea that you could, oh. It's a stealth bomber, yeah. Yeah, one of the things I was thinking about for this was the way that, um, they're, and they're doing um, a sun salutation. The figures are doing a, a yoga sun salutation. Um, and so one of the things I was thinking a lot about is the way that, like, basically, I'm going to say it in a sort of crude way, but pacifism and the military-industrial complex are linked uh, in the sense that um, one of the things that makes it possible to get yoga mats, to get uh, this time and space and um, leisure to do yoga, uh, is all of the um, uh, threat of air violence uh, that that happens in an empire. So I was thinking about that contradiction a lot, like, like you know, having a, having a coffee, th you know, you know, a bowl, you know, like all of the gasoline that goes into this, all of the. Um, ugly shit that goes into uh, all of the nice shit. And I was just kind of thinking about, uh, I don't know, that kind of stuff. Um, here's a little child with a predator drone um, on, a, on a knife. So it's similar, similar kind of meditation, like, like what, uh, what, it, what it is to, the contradictions of living in an empire, which I, I think of, where, I don't know, it's kind of, I think it is an empire. Ooh, it sticks into the wall, it's a little knife that sticks into the wall. Uh, and this is a little guy with a, you can't really, it says Novus Order Seclorum, which is the new order of the world, it's from the um, uh, dollar bill. Uh, thinking a lot about the, um, I don't know, back to the kind of theme of, uh, you know, the, the, the conceptual and visual sort of Masonic foundations. Of, is this too weird? Um, foundations of currency, government, stuff like that. And then my favorite uh, image from the January 6th thing was, uh, this is the, uh, Anuit kept this is like, I think it's like, um, and he approved of what they had begun. Um, and that's it. That's it. That's all I got. Um, that's where I'm at. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions? You don't have to. Thank you for coming. Thank you.